All right. It's a great pleasure of mine and honor to be here. Um, yeah, as, as Dan mentioned, my name is Jonas. I originally came from the East Coast. Um, I grew up in upstate New York. You're going to hear some stories about myself, just hopefully to get to know you a little better. But one of the things I wanted to talk about today is um, this idea of like, what is God's will? I don't know if any of you have ever asked that question of like, what does God want me to do in my life? So when I was applying to college a long, long time ago, maybe some of the youth here can commiserate with that process. I remember getting into a couple of different schools and um, after I got in, we went on these school visits and I remember having a hard time deciding which school I wanted to go to. And there was a part of me that, you know, just wanted someone else to decide for me. I don't know if any of you are like this. I, I kind of sometimes shy away from wanting to take responsibility. And so I asked my mom, I said, I knew my mom had a school she wanted me to go to. And so I asked my mom, I asked her, mom, which school do you want me to go to? Um, for those of you that are curious, and this question is going to burn through your mind for the entire sermon if I don't tell you, the schools I was deciding between were University of Washington in Seattle and UC Davis. Now, I knew my mom wanted me to go to UC Davis. Um, and the reason she wanted me to go to UC Davis is because at that point in time, my older brother was in law school in UC Davis. And so she was like, oh, if Jonas goes to where his brother is, you know, his brother will keep him out of trouble and all of that. So I knew that walking in. I asked my mom this question because I wanted her to tell me, Jonas, you should go to UC Davis. Because if she did that and I had a miserable time at UC Davis, I could be like, mom, it's all your fault. <laughs> but my mom, uh, who is immensely wise, said, Jonas, you should make the decision yourself, which, you know, foiled my entire plan. But I think a lot of times when we approach God, we approach him with that same sort of attitude. We say, God, just tell me what to do. Like, I don't want to have to think about it. I don't want to have to process it. Just tell me what to do. What college should I go to? Uh, what school should my kids go to? Where should I live? What job should I take? And a lot of times, you know, we want to know what God wants for us in these areas. And I think that's great, but I would challenge us today to think about, to, to see, right, how can we make that decision when sometimes God seems to give us the answer that my mom gave me? Jonas, you decide. Well, how do I know what you want, God? Do you want me at UW or do you want me at UC Davis? And I'm going to challenge you today is that as we look at this question, maybe we need to start thinking about it a little differently. And so I would like to share with us today what I, what I see through Scripture, what the Bible tells us about this question. So if we could jump to the next slide. So a lot of times we come into these decision points in life, and sometimes we, we kind of, I would say, jump the gun in terms of thinking about what, um, what kind of is important to God in making these decisions. Uh, and, and I'll admit for me, when I was deciding what college to go to, I couldn't really think beyond like, what, where am I gonna end up? For those of you that are completely wondering, I did end up in Seattle, not Davis. Um, and I made that decision because God, well, God gave me the, the immense providence of being able to make that decision. But I think what was important is that when I, in making that decision, there was one significant question that I think that is important for each of us, and I believe, and I believe scripture demonstrates this, that um, we always have to ask when making any of these decisions, which is, which decision is gonna bring me closer to God? Now, we can look at all the different factors, right? Like certain things came into play. I wanted to be a business major and the only business major in Davis for undergrad was how to manage a farm. And I was like, I don't, not quite what I'm looking for. Um, but a lot of that, looking back at it now especially, looking back at 
the time I spent saying, what church am I going to go to? What fellowship am I going to go to? Seeking after what was going to build my relationship with God. Because I believe that at its core, um, when we seek after God's will, we have to understand what God wants. And what God wants fundamentally is a relationship with each one of us. And so if that's God's purpose, if that's what God wants, then that should play an enormous role in how we make our decisions. So if you can go to the next slide, um, we're going to look at a passage today, a very short passage. Um, this passage is one of my favorite passages. I love this passage growing up because um, it contains one of the shortest verses in the Bible that I could memorize outside of Jesus wept. So that's why growing up in church, I love this. It was one extra verse that I could memorize that was only two words. Um, some translation. Translations have more. But 1 Thessalonians 5, from verses 16 to 18, we talked about the idea that, that God's primary goal, right, is relationship. It's relational. And for me, I didn't really come to start understanding this until um, many, many years down the line. But when I started to look at God and Scripture in this way, like a lot of things started clicking together. Like why God did this? Oh, that kind of makes sense. Um, it's because he's looking for that relationship with the humanity that he created. And so um, when we understand that, right, we understand who God is and what he's looking for, um, then the way that God speaks into our lives kind of changes it, God, now we see, we sang about the idea that God is this great sovereign God. He wants what's best for us. And so when I think about, when I start to get these, when I start to face these decisions and I run into this part where, where God gives me a choice and I'm like, I don't know which one to do, um, then this is, for me, a rubric that maybe helps. Sometimes we, we like to throw in like, but what about the practical thing, right? Like, you know, um, if going back in time, I would, have, I would personally have wanted to be a philosophy major. But of course, being a good Asian kid, I know the question that would come up if I told my mom, mom, I want to be a philosophy major. And the question that comes, but how will you feed yourself? But what kind of job are you going to get with a humanities major? This is not a knock against humanities majors. I envy all of you somewhat. <laughs> I wish I was a humanities major. But the, the idea here, right, is that, that God, and, and a lot of times we bring these butts up to God, right? Like, oh, how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to find a job? How am I going to do this X, Y, and Z? And we try to kind of contingency plan around God. But if God's focus, right, is the will, his will is having that relationship, then he says, get this right first and everything else will kind of figure out. Everything else will kind of work out. So let's look at this passage really quick. Uh, jump to the next slide. So short passage is three statements and I'm gonna have four points come out of this statement. So the statement is rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we see Paul lays it out very straightforward here. If you go to the next slide, I did a little color coding here. This is the will of God. Okay, we were asking, what is the will of God? Well, the will of God for us begins first in Christ Jesus. So we jump to the, the next slide. God's will for us is to be in Christ Jesus. That's what the text says, right? That's where it starts. A relationship with God always has to begin with Jesus. It's always only through Jesus that we can truly have the relationship, the love relationship with God that God desires for us. To sum this up in another way, if we go to the next slide, God's will for us is to be in a relationship with him through Christ Jesus. God's desire is that we are as close and intimately related to him as he is with the rest of 
the Trinity. Like he, as closely as God the Father is related to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, he wants to be, he wants us to experience that communion and that relationship. And so if that is the primary thing, we need to, we need to get that down first. That's the most important thing that God wants for us. So before we think about the practicalities, how am I going to get to work? How am I going to, um, what am I going to study? Our focus that God tells us is to be on our relationship with him. I'm going to share an example. There's a little picture that's going to come up in this next slide. And it is, um, this is going to date me a little. So this is, um, this was my dream console growing up. This is a PlayStation 2, not 3, 4, or 5, it's number 2. So when I was a kid, my parents tried to incentivize me to study. Um, and they said, Jonas, if you do well on your exams, we will buy you a console of your choice. They did this with my brother. Um, to date myself even further, my brother's console of choice was an original NES. So this point in time, I'm in school, my parents tell me the same thing, and they're like, okay, we'll get you any console you want. And I'm sitting there at that point in time, I thought I was being really smart, I probably in retrospect was not. Um, the, the choices back then for me were either a Nintendo 64 or a PlayStation, a Sony PlayStation. And I had heard about this thing that was coming out called the PlayStation 2, and it could play all of the original PlayStation games. And I was like, I'm gonna get that one. Now, there's this saying in English called putting the cart before the horse. So, so before I even, you know, for me, it would be weird to start planning like, okay, when I get my PlayStation 2, I'm gonna get these games, I'm gonna get these classic PS1 games, and I'm gonna have this amazing library. And the, the key here is that, well, maybe I should focus more on like doing well on my test so I actually get the PlayStation 2 before I decide what games I really want. Because I was gonna be like, oh man, I'm gonna have like all of the Final Fantasies and my friends over there, like, whoa! And um, it would be kind of embarrassing if I tell all my friends, like, oh man, I'm getting a PlayStation 2, I'm getting a PlayStation 2, and, um, and then comes around, friends like, wait, dude, where's your PlayStation? It's like, man, I didn't, I, I, I failed in English. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it didn't work out, whoops. Um, so in that sense, right, like, I think we want to make sure that uh, we focus, we get, like, the first things first right. So, yes, God wants us to enjoy all of these blessings that he has in store for us in life. But the primary purpose of those blessings is for us to, to, to get closer to him, right? Right? Um, the primary purpose for the PlayStation 2 in my family was for me to get good grades. And, and the relationship that allows that sort of transaction was me and my parents. Um, my parents did not simply, for me in middle school, like maybe I thought of it this way in middle school, which is, you know, how a lot of middle schoolers think sometimes, or at least I did. Um, my parents did not really just become a vessel for me to get like a PlayStation 2. Right, like that's not all that was, right? After I got my PlayStation 2, it wasn't like, thank you parents, you've done your job. But here, we see that, that God wants us to focus on the f first things first. Um, I know, I've talked with Dan, Dan mentioned, I talk a lot of basketball. Um, I love following the NBA, I used to be, um, long, long time ago, an NBA blogger. And a lot of times when I talk to Dan, and the reason I like, like, team sports, so I play volleyball myself, um, is that it sometimes serves as a really good example. So another example of this, uh, maybe more relatable to, to the non-gamers, uh, is that in team sports, right, a lot of times putting the cart before the horse is like, before tryouts, he's like, dude, when, when, I'm, when I'm the starter on the team, like, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna do the staff, I'm gonna do the walk away three, and I'm gonna hit that game buzzer, game winner, and the final game, and then we're gonna go to states, and, and you know, the realistic, the, the, there's a part of us who are sort of we're like, okay, dream big, but uh, make the team first. And then you can talk about what number jersey you're going to wear and, and what shots you're going to hit and maybe if, you, if you're going to start. So if we move on then, 
um, I want to show from, demonstrate from scripture where I'm kind of getting this. And so one of the things that we see in scripture, John 3, 16, most well-known verses in the world, and, it, and a lot of people say this sort of summarizes what Christianity is about, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So the, you know, kind of we see that, that God sent Jesus for us to have eternal life. Now, we see underneath there, there's a verse that's kind of corollary to that. And this happens when Jesus is praying. And, he, and Jesus defines eternal life for us. He defines eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So if we kind of tie those together, and the next slide has some color codes, we see that, that this idea of eternal life, that God came to give us eternal life, and, and we see that Jesus says eternal life is a relationship with God. Eternal life is being with God. No, in this sense, is not just like I know about God, right? It's not just, you know, um, it's, it's not just I have this information, right? As, as, a, as an NBA fan, right, I naturally fell into the um, rabbit hole of becoming like a stat head, right? And so for me to say like, oh yeah, I know Steph, he averages, you know, like 40, was it like 43% three-point shooting and like 50% from the field, I can start rattling all off these stats, right? And tell you like, yeah, I know Steph really well. But I don't have Steph's phone number. And if I did and I called him, I don't think he'd pick up. Um, and if he did pick up, he would be like, who is this? And so, so I think for us, right, for, for a lot of this, um, when I say the, 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 the idea behind this message is that it's really simple, but it's not easy. And it, it, part of this is we reframing how we think about some of these words. So it's simple in the sense it's very straightforward, but it's not easy in the sense that when we try to put this into practice, sometimes it's gonna take some effort, it's gonna take some work, but it's also gonna take, um, it's also gonna be uncomfortable and it will ultimately take kind of supernatural intervention on the part of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to kind of change how we look at these things. And so the no here that is emphasized in John, 3, uh, John 17, 3, where Jesus is defining eternal life, is this very like intimate, like, I know you, right? I know, um, like, I can, I can anticipate your actions, right? Like, I, I know you so well that I will finish your sentences, right? Uh, here, no is often used biblically also in a very, you know, intimate sense, right? When, when, a man knows his wife and then they have a kid. It's kind of what it's talking about. Um, it, it means, though, saying that I, I know you at the deepest, most intimate level, and that is eternal life, knowing God and Jesus at that deepest, most intimate level. Another part of it is if we turn to Matthew 22, um, Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment. And the greatest commandment is love God. And the second one is love people. And so we, uh, we see here that God's focus, again, the greatest commandment to love God means that God wants us to love him. And it's not just this idea of um, warm, fuzzy feelings. I think love is another word that I, I would love to reclaim from popular usage. A lot of times when we say love, we, say, we talk about it as, a, as this warm, fuzzy feeling. And so we love everything, and I use this example a lot. We love everything the same way we love pizza. I love pizza. Right? Um, some of you look at me and say, like, Jonas, you love pizza a little too much. But, you know, we, the, how do we love pizza? What does it mean when I say I love pizza? It means that when I put it in my mouth, I get this warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I feel nice. It feels good. It tastes good. Um, you know, maybe I won't feel so good the next morning, but right now, it feels good. I love pizza. And so sometimes when we say, like, I love God, or I love some, my mom, I love my dad, I love my significant other, we, 
it, it's hard for us to like get past that, the way we love pizza. Because the way we love pizza is all about myself. Because, but loving God means something different. It means that this is a love that drives us to action. And so I want to lay this down before we go back to our original passage, get to the, the three main points. Is Next slide, there, there is this dilemma that the Israelites faced in Exodus 33. Um, I have read Exodus a lot, and it was only a few years ago that I really, really kind of paid attention to this passage, and this has become one of my, like, go-to passages, one of my favorite passages. So in Exodus 33, from verses 1 through 3, God tells Moses this. He says, you know what? I am done with you, Israelites. All right? I don't want anything to do with you. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you your promised land. I'll send an angel in, and I will kill off all of your enemies in the promised land. And you can go live in the milk and hunt land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm done with you. You go on your own. I'm not going with you. That was the option that God gave to the Israelites. And there are a lot of times, if I'm really honest with myself, yeah, that sounds pretty nice. I would love... You know, God, God says, I'm going to make your life set. I made you a promise. I'm going to give you the promised land, and I will keep that promise. But you are no longer my people. And fortunately for us, the Israelites responded in a way that was appropriate to, to what, what God was saying. They said they heard this disastrous word. And they said, God, anything but leaving us on our own. We need you to go with us, because if you're not with us, none of this matters. Now, we know the history of the Israelites, for those of us that have been in church for a while, and it doesn't turn out great for them, because they don't follow with that same level of zeal or fervor. But for us, we have to understand, like, God's goal is relational. And if I'm really just interested in his blessings, then God says, okay, fine, go it and have it. And that is... The Bible tells us one of the scariest things out there. And so if that's really that scary, that that for the Israelites, this is a disaster, then for us in our lives, right, how do we seek to have this relationship with God, have God going with us wherever we go? Three things that Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians 5. If we jump to the next slide. They are rejoicing. They are praying and giving thanks. And so we're going to, in the, the time we have left, we're going to kind of look at what these three things look like. So the first one, rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus does not mean, I, I used to read this verse and I used to think like, like I have to be like happy all the time, huh? Because that's, that's what joy, right? Like, you, you know, be joyful always is another way to translate it. Um, you know, Philippians, Paul says a lot of the same stuff. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will tell you, rejoice. And I'm like, man, I just don't have the disposition to be that happy. Right? Where, where I'm running around and I'm clapping, yay! I, it's hard for me to get that excited about things, let alone, like just a normal basis, let alone at all times in all places. But rejoicing, I think, is more here of a, of a kind of a big picture temperament, where it's like, I went through that, right? I think, how many of you guys have ever played in like a, a high school sports team or school sports team of any sort, right? Handful of us? Okay, so there is this sense of a lot of times, like at the end of the year in a sp- school sports season, um, if you haven't played, maybe you've watched uh, a drama or a show or an anime that's about a sports team, and you kind of see this in the last episode, where you go through all of this stuff, and at the end of the day, it's like, oh, man, this is worth it, right? This is why you see like, professional athletes crying when they fail or when they achieve their goal of winning you know, a shiny golden ball on a pedestal. Because when you put it like that, right, it's kind of, that's, that's what they're doing. They're playing a game. Um, but you see that because you, it's of everything they've gone through. And they would say, like, yeah, that was, that was all worth it. Like, I had joy 
in that experience. Now, did it mean that in the moment, right, and maybe Dan as a coach can, can relate to this, at that moment when your team is not doing well and you're just like, okay, we're just doing suicides. Those of you who don't know who suicides are, they are the probably worst thing in the, the world of sports. It's basically you run from line to line across the gym as fast as you can. Um, it wears out your stamina, everything. It's really good exercise, but it's, it's also <laughs> very, very painful. There's a reason most coaches use this as punishment for like if your team doesn't do well. But in the middle of running suicides, I don't know if there's any like teammate, if there's any athlete, maybe there's one, I, don't, I can't think of any that's like, yes, this is the best thing ever. I love suicides, right? I, I don't know if... I don't know of, of any situation where like in the midst of the struggle where you're like, yes, I am so happy that I get to run more suicides or I get to do more wall sits. But at the end of it, right, if you were to ask that person, that player, hey, did you enjoy playing this season? The answer would, for most, I hope, those of you still in sports, I hope this is your answer. At the end of the season, it's, yeah, no, that was totally worth it. Like, I really liked volleyball. Did I like having to do push-ups every time our team missed a serve because our team was really bad at serving? No. Did I, did I like having to do conditioning and, wall and, 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 and stair jumps because our coach said, you guys are not that great, so we're just going to... We're going to outcondition the other team. No, I didn't enjoy that at all. I just was like, hey, why can't we just like, you know, play volleyball? <laughs> but the mark of that is that it's marked, right, with joy. So I love Calvin and Hobbes. This is an old comic for those of you that maybe before your times, it's a classic, go look it up, Bill Watterson. Um, there's a lot of things that I enjoy about Calvin and Hobbes. And one of them, though, is that I think there's this intimate relationship between Calvin and Hobbes that, you know, you see here, right, like, they have good times together, but even then, they're, like, fighting a lot, right? There's, there's this thing where, like, I don't know if Calvin, you know, again, this is an imaginary character, so we can speculate all we want, but I don't know if Calvin enjoys getting pounced by Hobbes every time he comes home after school. Like, there's a thing where Calvin comes home, and he gets tackled by Hobbes, and, you know, he gets in trouble for it a lot, too. Um, and so... Part of this is having our, you know, having that, that relationship. Is my relationship with God one marked with joy? In that saying that I would not give up anything else in this world for this relationship. Like everything there is worth it. Even the hard times, this relationship is so great that this is worth it to me. Um, the next part of this is prayer. Now, the interesting thing about this is prayer is the one thing out of this list that is not like a B like that, but this is actually something you can do. And it says pray without ceasing. Um, like, like me not being able to like run around and be like, oh, I'm so happy, 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 joy, joy, all the time. Um, prayer is not like I have my head bowed and my eyes closed and I just kind of walk, stumble around, hoping not to run into anything. But praying continually, right? If we understand prayer as a mode of communication, then prayer, maybe another way to think of prayer is like your favorite texting app because that's one of the primary ways of communicating nowadays. So be it Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, or actual messages, or Slack, or whatever it might be, the, if you think about that as kind of like prayers, like how am I in constant communication with God? And, and if prayer is a conversation with God, then the, part of that relationship can be illustrated by saying, like praying continually just means like, I'm always telling God everything. So one thing to think about is, in, in regards to assessing our own personal relationship with God, is what do I tell God? Like think about when something good happens to you. 
who is the first person you tell? Or who are the first maybe five people you tell? Right? Maybe the first person just happens to be there. Um, but who are the people you're like, I can't wait to tell this person about it? And is God one of those people? This is one thing that I think as I have grown in my own Christian walk and I've talked to a lot of people that I have a hard time and I think a lot of others have a hard time kind of conceptualizing. We understand this concept that God is a person, but um, like in our brains, we, we know like we can say God is a person. Yeah, no, God's a person. God's, you know, three persons in one. We, but the idea of like, okay, what does that mean then? Like what does it mean for me to treat God like a real person? person. Um, you know, I, I'm going to bring back an example from Calvin and Hobbes. You don't need to go back, but Calvin and Hobbes, the premise of Calvin and Hobbes is that the interesting thing that I really appreciate about this, and I didn't realize there's, there's, a, there's actually like a website that's called like the Theology of Calvin and Hobbes. I think it goes a little far, but there's a basic premise in there that's actually interesting, which is this, that when Bill Watterson draws the comic, Whenever it's just Calvin and Hobbes together in the panel, Hobbes is a real tiger. Whenever anyone else walks into the panel, Hobbes becomes a stuffed tiger. And, and the challenge for us, right, but here's the, the catch. Calvin, regardless of how Bill Watterson draws Hobbes, Calvin never treats Hobbes like a stuffed tiger. Hobbes is very, very real to Calvin. And I think for us, a lot of times, right, like, I, I, I think that's actually a really good parallel for our relationship with, with God, our relationship with Jesus. A lot of times the world walks around and is like, oh, God, yeah, that's nice. He's up there, and, you know, if that relationship helps you out, then good for you. But do, what, is it, what would it look like in my life if I lived like God was like a real person next to me, right? Um, I, I don't know if, I've never done this because, you know, there was a, the, the pragmatism of growing up in an Asian household um, made kind of imaginary friends a little like taboo in the house where it's like, like, I don't know if I could get away with like, no, my friend John needs a t place setting at the dinner table because he's going to come eat with us. Right? But there is a sense where I think having that wonder, having that imagination to like say, to, to understand like I can't see and everyone else can't, I can't really see him and everyone else can't see him either, but he's really there. And having that sense of reality that Jesus is really there walking with us. And now if he is there, then I want to keep him updated on everything. And the great thing about this idea of praying continually is that when I'm talking to Jesus, right, not only does Jesus, is Jesus, does Jesus love me, but he has the time. So here's the amazing thing about Jesus. He spans the spectrum. Not only does Jesus love me so much that there's nothing too small for me to bring to him. Right? I don't know if you have a friend like this who will like update you about every single little detail about his or her life. And it's just sort of like, I stubbed my toe. I'm like, okay. You're telling me because I just wanted you to know I stubbed my toe this morning and it hurt a lot. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there, there is that sense where it's like, you know, I, as you can tell, I'm probably not the most empathetic person. Right, right? Whereas, you know, I think Jesus might be a little more like, oh man, that's, that's so terrible. Like, I bet you that hurt a lot. Man, I, you know. And that's the relationship, that's the closeness that Jesus wants with us, the having that communication. At the same time, because of who Jesus is, there is nothing too big for Jesus to handle. That we, there's nothing we can't bring to Jesus that Jesus is like, oh man, this is like kind of, I don't know what to do about this. Um, recently, uh, my parents and I, uh, we recently bought a house up in Campbell, and um, it was a really old house, we needed to do renovations, and the thing with doing renovations, I was like, okay, we're gonna do this all by the book. We're gonna go and we're going to um, get the inspectors, and, um, and it's gonna go smoothly. Like, I'm gonna, the inspector's gonna be like, okay, this is great, and uh, you, know, you can have this renovation, and then it's all gonna go smoothly. Um, as you can tell, it doesn't. <laughs> so 
The inspector shows up and he's like, yeah, this is wrong with your house, this is wrong with your house, this is wrong with your house. It looks like your contractor didn't do this right. You need to do this. You need to add these, this new piping. You need to do all of this and then, like, then come back and tell us. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, uh, first time homeowner, I don't really know what's going on, but okay. Um, and then, so I call, my, I call my parents and my mom's like, like, you know, there's not really anything. She's like, she doesn't know either. She doesn't know how to help. And so there's a, there's a sense of like, I, I want to bring this problem to get help, but I don't know either. Like, I'm sitting there and I have all of these sort of backlog of like stuff that I need to get done. I'm going to Taiwan on a mission trip in a week and I'm going to be gone for like 10 days and sort of, oh man, what do I do? <laughs> what do I, how do I, how do I get through this? Um, cause my mom can't help me. My brother's not going to help me. I don't know anyone else that's going to help me. Inspector seems relatively unsympathetic. Like, I just got to figure this out, right? But with God, right, like, he knows everything. He's able to do everything. And so when I bring it to him, right, God, as the, as the, the creator of the universe, right, is willing to listen to all of our problems, big and small. And it's something that I knew in my head growing up in church but thinking about that in reality was just kind of like, that's actually, that's pretty amazing. Like, I am one text message away from, you know, um, one text message away from the God who made everything. Like, I, it's almost, I can't really think of any, like, comparison with that. Uh, it, it's, but... Again, that, that great spectrum, that dichotomy, we are my, what am I telling God, right? What am I, am I, not only is, am, am I bringing my problems, right? I think for us, a lot of times, it's kind of one or the other. For me, I'm a guy who, who wants to be sort of self-sufficient, so it's hard sometimes for me to bring my problems to God, because it's sort of, oh man, God, like, you know, um, I'm, sure you're, I'm sure you're busy, you got like, Bigger, bigger fish to fry, like there's an earthquake over here, there's like famine over here. Um, you know, my house thing, it's not that big of a deal, God. Like, I'll, I'll kind of take care of it. Don't worry about it. I don't want to bother you, right? Nice, nice sort of Asian politeness. Like, oh, sorry, I don't want to bother you. I don't want to inconvenience you in any way, God. But the nature of a close relationship, right? The closest relationships are ones where you can inconvenience the other person. Uh, you know, if... Whoever you are willing, right? The demonstration of a, a close relationship. This is this is not the definitive, but one of them is: who can you call at two thirty a.m. because something terrible has happened, and they will not be like, "Why are you calling me? I'm going back to sleep." Right? Who can you call that will be like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm out there, I'm, I'm with you, I'm going to be with you right away? Like, who do you not feel bad calling? And I think that is the sign, that is a sign of a deeply intimate relationship. And that's the type of relationship that God wants from us, where we can sell it, where God wants to celebrate the little victories in our lives with us, no matter how small. And he also wants to walk through with us with the greatest burdens in our lives, no matter how great. Finally, we get to giving thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of Christ Jesus. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. And this does not, this is, this is one that I think is sometimes a challenge because the quick, if I read over this very quickly, and like, like, you know, am I supposed to give thanks for, like, bad things happening? Um, I had a major car issue this couple weeks ago. Um, I I'm not, won't go into details, but the short of it is while I was driving, my wheel popped off. It was actually kind of scary. My wheel popped off in the middle of driving. Um, what happened was basically uh, all the, like half of my struts on the wheel got sheared off. I had major work done. But I wasn't sitting there, you know, I don't, I don't know the Bible is telling me at that time when the wheel pops off. I was like, thank you, God, for a mechanical failure in my car moving 30 miles an hour. But what God is saying here, what Paul is saying here, that in the midst of all things, 
if we have a genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we will always have something to be thankful for. And God is encouraging us, Paul is encouraging us to remember those things. That no matter what happens in this world, God still loves each one of you. God still desires to be in a relationship with each one of you. And those of you that have experienced the save, saving grace through a relationship in, uh, to, with, in a relationship with God through Christ, then you know that, that no matter what, nothing is going to take that away. Things may be terrible, like I may lose my job, I may lose my house, I may lose my car, I may lose my family, but I am still, I still have eternal life. I still know God, and nothing is going to take that away. So as we look at those three things, right, we say, all right, do I see my life with God as one of joy? Do I, am, I, do, am I constantly communicating with God? Am I able to give thanks because, you know what, no matter what, God is on my side and God loves me. And we see those are all signs of a close, intimate relationship. And that's God's will for us, that close, intimate relationship. So maybe at this point, um, if we go to the next slide, you're asking me, well, what about when like, a big decision comes up? What about when I do have to decide, should I take this job here or that job over there? Should I, should I, take this, should I stay here in California? Should I move to um, somewhere with a lower cost of living? Should I, should, I, uh, should I ask this person out? Is this the one that God has prepared for me? Should I buy this house? Should I buy this car? Where should I go to school? What classes should I take? All of that. What about all of that? Well, we jump to the next slide. I encourage you to remember it. Let's get the first thing down. Which choice will bring me into a closer relationship with God? When I was applying to college, I didn't really, I didn't have that this formulated yet. But looking back, right, I, I think God was working in my life and bringing this to my attention. And the, the, the thing that happens is, Maybe I say, maybe I look at that and I say, you know what, I could have grown equally at UW as I could have in UC Davis. And what I have to say to that is like, hallelujah, praise the Lord, right? Like God has given me two amazing choices. And so then it's okay for me to look at, say, which school has the better program? Where do I think I'll make more friends, right? Like all these secondary kind of tertiary things but the first and foremost in every single choice that we make is, will it bring me closer to God? And so as you go out in your life and you're seeking the will of God, understand that the Bible tells us it all has to start here. The Bible is one great story about God chasing after the people he created because he loves them and he wants them to love him. That's the story of the Bible. And so everything the Bible is telling us that like, oh, you should do this when we read it or you should do that comes in that context of this, if you do this, it will bring you in a closer relationship with God because that is what God ultimately wants for each one of us. Uh, Jump to the next slide. For, for all of us here, some of us maybe, we haven't decided yet that, you know, I'm not sure about this God. I'm not sure about this Jesus. Um, but hopefully, uh, as, you, as you hear the word of God, as you hear the gospel, as you see the people around you, you'll come to recognize that <coughs> you'll come to see that, hey, maybe this way of life seems to work. 
that that I want to live in a in I want to live a life where in the arms of a loving creator God that knows me. For those of us that maybe have made that decision already, I ask you as you move forward, where does God fit into your decision making? Where does your relationship with God fit into that? <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm gonna challenge you today with those two questions. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for bringing us here today. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to want to know you more. You'd put in our hearts a desire to draw closer to you, to live a life as you want us to live it, that is always rejoicing, that is continually praying, and that's giving thanks in all circumstances. Thank you for speaking to us today. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.